everybody, welcome to Pick Dr. Osborne's Brain. We're going to be talking all about blood pressure in this show. So if you've got questions about natural ways to lower blood pressure, if you've got even more complex questions about what um, effectively, what certain blood pressure medications can do, what kind of side effects to look out for, whatever you've got, pump it into the feed. I'll do my best to get it answered tonight. And stay with me. We're going to be talking about the pharmaceutical influence on calling normal blood pressure, high blood pressure. That's a big one. We're going to be talking about how that happened. If you don't know that history, stay with me. We're also going to be talking about how a number of different medications can, that are designed to lower blood pressure actually in the long run end up causing high blood pressure, the irony, right? Uh, so we're going to dive into that as well as nutritional strategies to overcome high blood pressure, diet and lifestyle strategies to overcome high blood pressure. And so stay with me because we're going to be covering that later in the show. First, we're going to dive in some just generalized helpful information for you around blood pressure. So welcome to the show. And um, let's dive in first to the function of blood. So, I mean, we're talking about blood pressure. It's also important to understand what the function of the blood is because the pressure regulates how blood flow happens, right? And so we have very key, very critical functions of blood. Number one, it delivers oxygen and nutrients, right? So we get oxygen, I mean that substance that every cell in your body requires in order to generate energy, but also nutrients, vitamins and minerals. Your blood is the super highway that delivers this, right? So if you've got poor pressure or poor blood flow, this is gonna be hindered and that's gonna affect your ability to heal, to rest, restore, to repair. It's gonna affect you all the way across the board. We also know that your blood carries hormones. So thyroid hormone, adrenal hormones like cortisol and adrenaline and epinephrine. It carries your sex steroids. Remember blood is the super highway of your hormones. It also carries your immune cells. So those of you worried about immune function, right? We need the blood to function well. Those white blood cells and the different classes of white blood cells are delivered through the blood. And then lastly, one of its main functions is it regulates waste and pH. pH stands for power of hydrogen. It's the acidity or alkalinity of the bloodstream itself and that waste regulation. How do we take out the trash, right? How do we do that? We do that through water, right? Water is necessary to cleanse and clean and you know, blood is predominantly water. So these are the important functions of blood and it's important that you know that because we get into blood pressure and when blood pressure is altered, it can be quite dangerous. So statistically speaking, we know that one in three U.S. adults truly has high blood pressure. That's just in the U.S. alone, 67 million people. Now, again, we can talk about how they've manipulated that number, how the pharmaceutical companies have influenced that and manipulated that number. We'll get to that. High blood pressure contributes to 1,000 deaths per day. Right? Like You look at this compared to the, you know, the virus that shall not be named, it, that virus holds a zero candles up to blood pressure as a problem, right? And so we, when you think about the, the nationwide and really the global like response to that virus versus what it actually should be for something that's truly dead, deadly and dangerous, um, we know our health authorities are failing us. And then we also know that high blood pressure is listed as a cause of death for about 348,000 Americans just in 2008. Now, this number varies from year to year, but... You know, again, multiply this over decades and you've got blood pressure being the cause of millions and millions and millions of deaths just in the U.S. alone, not including other European and other industrialized countries. We know that high blood pressure is a major risk for heart attacks, strokes, kidney disease, and diabetes complications. Now, pay attention because, again, I'm going to talk about some medicines here in a minute and, and what commonly are used to regulate in medicine diabetes kidney disease, as well as risk for heart attacks and risk for strokes. When we get into the medicines, remember, because I don't want to come all the way back to this, but remember these things, that blood pressure increases the risk for those things, which by default increases your risk for being medicated for those things, which can actually, again, increase your risk for developing um, blood pressure problems. So we'll get to that. So three ways, these are, think of these things here as categories of reasons. Blood pressure is very complex and, it's, and there are a number of feedback loops. There are neurological feedback loops. There are, there are oxygen sensory loops uh, within your blood vessels. So multiple ways that our body helps to try regulate blood pressure. So when it goes up or it elevates, I'm trying to simplify a complex topic for you. There are three 
big reasons, categorically speaking, why blood pressure will elevate. Number one is low oxygen to the brain. Inside your blood vessels, you have O2 sensors. These sensors register the quantity of oxygen coming through the carotid artery to your brain. And if that oxygen level reads low, it sends a feedback loop neurologically uh, to your heart and your cardiovascular system to increase pressure in an effort to try to drive more oxygen to the brain. So think about that in terms of what we do, what doctors do in medicine, and, and how ironic that is, is that they're trying to lower your pressure by reducing your risk, but in effect, they're lowering the quantity of oxygen that can actually get to your brain, but your body's saying, we need higher pressure because we need more oxygen to the brain, right? So the drug works against, in many cases, what the body is trying to do. And so, and just intuitively, this right here, if this is the reason you're developing high blood pressure, there's better ways to explore that than medication in terms of solutions. We also know that chronic stress can drive blood pressure. And one of the big reasons why this can happen is chronic stress drives hormones like adrenaline and cortisol. You know, long-term cortisol elevations cause elevation in blood pressure. Adrenaline, or, or otherwise known as epinephrine, causes elevation in blood pressure. And so again, chronic stress drives these hormones up and increases that. Chronic stress also increases your blood sugar and over time, blood sugar increases your blood viscosity or your thickness of your blood. And that when your blood, remember your blood is mostly water and it, and it should have a water-like viscosity or viscousness. Um, but when you drive up the glucose, you drive up the fluidic stickiness, if you will, of blood, making pressure go up because your heart and your blood vessels have to work harder to push sticky blood through your deep vessels. And then the third big reason, again, categorically is inflammation. And there are various sundry causes of inflammation. I mean, there's, there's, there's toxins that we're exposed to environmentally. There can be food, uh, food chemicals or components, food allergies that can drive inflammation. Heavy metals can drive inflammation number of things here drive this last process. And the inflammation, generally speaking, again, this occurs to the, to the epithelial lining, the interior lining of your blood vessels, and it can reduce nitric oxide production, which causes vasoconstriction of the vessel itself instead of vasodilation. And that can, again, lead to that um, Lead, that inflammation can lead to that, leading to heightened blood pressure. Okay, let's talk about some of the independent or individual causes. So these, every one of these things could be placed into, again, a category in this slide. So if we look at, if we look at these causes of high blood pressure, we've got obesity. Obesity, for every, approximately for every extra pound of fat you have, your body has to grow miles of blood vessels to feed that fat. So again, the more mileage you say you, your body has to build in blood vessels, the greater degree of pressure you're gonna put on your heart and your cardiovascular system. So obesity definitely driving that. Now most people with obesity, this is a process of inflammation, right? Um, being overweight is an inflammatory situation. I know we're trying to normalize obesity and, and you see that a lot in, in press and on TV today, but, but obesity is an inflammatory problem. So let's not, let's, not, um, let's not delude ourselves of the truth. Sedentary lifestyle, and this sedentary lifestyle can lead to this, but sedentary lifestyle also creates poor flow of the fluid through your water. Remember, your body's 70% water and a big chunk of that, five liters of that is your blood. And, and so again, if you're sedentary and you're, and you're not moving, that blood is stagnant. Part of how we regulate blood pressure through activity is there are certain chemicals and hormones that are produced when we move our body. So being sedentary, we're not making those chemicals, blood pressure can go up. So, you know, so these two lack of exercise and sedentary lifestyle, both very, very similar. Now you could you could exercise regularly and still have a sedentary lifestyle. And I see a lot of people that are guilty of this where their day, they're sitting at a desk for eight hours and then maybe they go do like 30 minutes of exercise or an hour of exercise. So there's, there's an imbalance between their activity versus their sedentary 
behavior. Again, you can't trade one hour of exercise for 12 hours of sitting and being sedentary. You've got to have more balance. So this is where walking and movement, this is where, you know, when people talk about this, you know, 10,000 step rule, this is where a lot of this comes from. If you're moving more frequently throughout the course of your day, it's definitely better for you and better for your blood pressure. Not enough sunshine. This has to do with um, not enough sunlight can actually uh, alter a number of different hormones, but it causes vitamin D deficiency or it can contribute to low levels of vitamin D and vitamin D deficiency can contribute to high blood pressure. Poor muscle mass. Remember, muscle helps regulate how water moves through your body and fluidic movement through your body. So poor muscle mass is oftentimes associated with what? With obesity. And then we have risk factors of high blood pressure. These are things that are, are things that you can change that, that are behavioral in nature, right? So smoking, alcohol consumption, excessive caffeine. I see a lot of people where, um, you know, one cup of coffee is not, for most is not all that big a deal, but then I get people that come to see me that are drinking a pot of coffee every day, right? So they're getting the equivalent of anywhere from 500 to 1,000 milligrams of caffeine daily. And what does caffeine do? Caffeine's a stimulant. It stimulates the, the adrenal glands and stimulates adrenaline and, and uh, can really rise or elevate your blood pressure in high quantities. Little goes a long way. Diet, um, there are a number of factors around diet. Not one, all di not one diet is the right diet for absolutely everybody, but as a general rule, when I say diet, what we're really referring to is a diet full of processed junk food that's being called real food. A perfect example are these new meat burgers that aren't really made out of meat. They're made out of plant-based proteins and it's full of garbage. And they're trying to pump that into the kids today as a health food uh, because we're also trying to, to, to make kids and younger folks believe that somehow animals are causing global warming, which again, we don't have time to get into that tonight, but that's nonsense. But diet full of junk food, right? And carbohydrate toxicity, carb, excessive carbohydrates drive up blood sugar, driven up blood sugar again, increases that viscosity to the blood, driving up pressure. Chronic allergies, and this could be food as well as environmental. And I see this frequently with people with not so much the allergy of gluten, but the sensitivity of gluten. So gluten sensitivity, very, very common uh, in this. High stress, I mentioned earlier, stress being a trigger, poor sleep, not getting adequate sleep, and shift work and this go the, you know these go hand in hand because if you're a shift worker oftentimes you're not sleeping well because of that shift work especially a lot of the nurses and military and firefighters that are out there that are doing you know three days of 12-hour shifts and they're working maybe those midnight shifts and then they come off of that three-day shift and now they're trying to accommodate to the regular schedule of everyone else and they keep yo-yoing back and forth that can create uh, havoc on your hormones and your blood pressure regulating hormones. Then there are medications, and we'll get into that shortly. Kidney disease, thyroid disease, adrenal disease. And so for, for most of these, these are what? These are inflammation. Disease means that your body's over inflamed and these organs are being damaged and their function is being diminished. And so inflammation can drive that. And what do doctors use to treat disease? Well, in today's world, they use medication. So if the medications that we're using to treat the disease uh, can actually be part of the problem of causing the blood pressure issue, where are we losing, where are we winning? We're gonna get more into the depths of that here in just a minute, so stay with me. Okay, let's talk next about diet and lifestyle change being, and this is, this is a true statement, right? So diet and lifestyle change are more effective than medicine at combating high blood pressure. It's just that unfortunately, most doctors, I can't say all, and I'm glad that I can't say all, but most doctors didn't get the memo or didn't read the research or didn't do a research review or literature review. Their focus is on putting you on medication without helping you understand this statement, right? And part of that, again, it's, it's hard to blame the doctor. I don't, I don't wanna sound anti-doctor uh, because a lot of doctors are working in a medical system that's completely fragmented and broken. It's just, you know, it's, it's decimated, it doesn't work, right? Because why? Because the average doctor in a regular typical practice sees anywhere from 30 to 50 patients a day. They don't have time to talk to you about diet and lifestyle. So what do they say? You know, within a three minute appointment where you can actually visit with the doctor, they say, 
you need to exercise and eat right, right? Exercise is part of the lifestyle diet is eat right, but they don't define what that means. What does it mean to eat right? What kind of exercise are we referring to? Like, what are we actually talking about doing? Um, and so when I, as a doctor, if I say exercise and eat right, but here also take these medicines, right? I'm not really helping you. I'm giving you medicine as a primary and I'm not allowing you the opportunity at diet and lifestyle change to see if your blood pressure changes. Now, on, on that same note, let's just pull this research study up. This is actually um, one of the connections between gluten and high blood pressure. It's a question that I get asked a lot. Can gluten sensitivity elevate somebody's blood pressure if a person's being exposed to gluten? And the simple answer is yes. And there have been a number of studies that have tracked this. As a matter of fact, one study showed that people who had celiac and people who avoided wheat and gluten, even if they didn't have celiac disease, when tracked over time, those individuals had lower blood pressure than people who did not avoid gluten. So we've got data like that. We've got data like this that shows that reversible hypertension uh, following celiac disease treatment. Well, what's the treatment for celiac disease? It's a gluten-free diet. Now, what's the connection between gluten and high blood pressure? Very simply put, this is substance that we make. It's normal called, it, it's a normal byproduct of human metabolism. So it's called homocysteine. You've probably heard me talk about this before. It's in, this, this chemical can be measured in your blood. Any doctor can measure it. And um, this chemical is normal. We all make it. But when it elevates to high levels, it actually causes a problem in the blood vessels where it damages your body's ability to make that substance called nitric oxide. Now, remember, nitric oxide won a Nobel Prize for its discovery. This is a very special chemical that dilates your blood vessels and allows the blood flow to go through them very well. And so homocysteine disrupts the ability of your blood vessels to produce that chemical. Now, homocysteine, again, we all make it. It's an exhaust of normal uh, methylation metabolism. But what's unique about gluten is gluten can damage absorption of B vitamins, and specifically as it relates to homocysteine, vitamin B6, vitamin B12, and folate, and technically also vitamin B2 and choline, uh, but we'll keep it at this, we'll keep it simple here. Um, these nutrients that are affected as a result of gluten malabsorption have been shown, and many celiac patients are, have been shown to have high levels of homocysteine, thus contributing to this damaged ability to produce nitric oxide, thus elevating blood pressure. And what you see here is adhering to a gluten-free diet was given oral iron folate B6 supplements as well as B12 injections for three months, blood pressure improved by six months and normalized by 15 months. Now notice this took 15 months. This is not an overnight thing. One of the things I get so sick of doctors trying to say is that diet change doesn't work because it didn't work overnight. It didn't work in 12 hours. You know, you take a blood pressure lowering medication. It works relatively quickly. But diet and lifestyle change, we're not expecting complete normalcy, right, of, of a problem overnight. It takes time and consistency. It's important to understand that part uh, so that you have realistic expectations. But Again, over the period of 15 months, right, we had very normal blood pressure in this particular case study. And this was, uh, you know, 128 over 80 normalized blood pressure at the end. So part of that was there was a parallel between this person's homocysteine level and their blood pressure elevation. Again, that's one of those correlations between gluten and diet change and blood pressure. It has to do with B vitamins. Let's talk about some other nutrients that we know and research studies have shown play a major role in blood pressure. And one of them is magnesium. Now, magnesium is an electrolyte. It's a, it's, I like to look at magnesium as Mother Nature's natural relaxer, right? So remember, your blood vessels are muscles, right? They have smooth, a smooth layer of muscle in them. That's what allows them to contract and relax. And magnesium 
regulates that relaxability and contractility of those smooth muscles. So does calcium, uh, which right here. So calcium and magnesium both play a major role together, um, helping your blood vessels contract and relax properly. Potassium also plays a major role in that. So these are nutrients that, again, if you're not sure, one of the best things, the easiest things, ask your doctor to measure your nutrition status. I've said this over and over and over and over again. Nutrients play a role in regulating so many chemical processes in the body, including blood pressure. It's a simple thing to measure them. Some research studies have shown that magnesium supplementation can lower blood pressure anywhere from three to nine points. There's some studies on B6 that show as many as 12 points of reduction in blood pressure. Potassium, CoQ10, there's some research studies that show CoQ10 can lower blood pressure 12, up to 12 points. Vitamin D, research anywhere between five and 10 points. Um, these are lots of points when you add them up. Imagine if you were vitamin D and B6 and calcium and magnesium deficient, right? You're looking at a potential of lowering your pressure. Maybe your pressure's in the 150s, maybe it's in the 160s. And look here, if we combine these things together, we've got like 30 points of potential lowering power there. And that, that could be the difference between abnormally high and normal, right? And taking away that risk factor. So these nutrients play a major role. Vitamin B1 as well, the side effect of B1 deficiency over time is a disease that affects your cardiovascular system called beriberi. And uh, beriberi can lead to congestive heart failure, which obviously that's fluid retention as well. It causes your blood pressure to go up. You need vitamin B1 to make the primary chemical that helps keep you relaxed, right? We talk about stress. We said stress earlier was a major trigger, categorical trigger. Why? Stress drives up adrenaline. Well, think of the counterbalance to adrenaline is a substance called acetylcholine. Choline's a B vitamin. The acetyl element of choline is actually produced by vitamin B1. And so vitamin B1 plus choline helps your body produce acetylcholine. If you're not making this because your vitamin B1 levels are too low, your blood pressure will go up. Your body needs that B1 to regulate it. Your body needs that acetylcholine, why? Whereas adrenaline drives your sympathetic nervous system, acetylcholine drives your parasympathetic nervous system. And parasympathetic is important, again, for calm and relaxation and sleep and recovery. And so we need this system to work because it helps regulate, downregulate, that, that sympathetic dominance that, that so many of us live in, in our you know, mainstream lifestyles where it's always go, 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 eat on the run. You know, sleep is not emphasized. The importance of sleep is not emphasized. The importance of not eating poison is not emphasized. There's so many things wrong with the standard uh, modern lifestyle that offsets the balance between these two. And again, nutrients regulate that and vitamin B1 is so important for that. I've seen cases of severe high blood pressure issues where, um, where you couldn't get it corrected until vitamin B1 was introduced. As a matter of fact, years ago, there was a, a group of researchers that went through hospitals. They were looking at patients particularly with congestive heart failure. And one of the things that they found was many of these patients had developed congestive heart failure as a result of taking diuretics. Diuretics are medicines or a type of medicine that reduce fluid. They reduce water in your body through your kidneys. So they cause your kidneys to push out more water. So again, diuretics cause water loss. And through that water loss, remember what vitamin B1 is. It's a water soluble vitamin. So what we also know about diuretics is they deplete, they don't just deplete water, but they deplete vitamin B1. Well, what these researchers found is that all these patients that were stuck in the hospital bed with congestive heart failure who were on diuretics, if they put them on vitamin B1, their congestive heart failure started to improve. And the reason why is diuretics cause B1 deficiency. So a lot of these patients started out with high blood pressure, but over time, as they were medicated with a diuretic to lower their blood pressure, they were actually causing, the medicine was causing vitamin B1 deficiency that was leading to congestive heart failure 
and a worsening of their cardiovascular risk factors. Again, it's one of those scenarios where the medicine, even with the best intention in the world, the medicine's trying to lower your blood pressure, the doctor's trying to lower your blood pressure, but there's a cause and effect, right? There's a reaction for every intent, and sometimes the road to hell is paved with good intention, and in many of the cases in people with diuretics is it causes massive deficiency, B1 being one of them. We'll talk more about additional examples of the same scenario, but again, I think it's important that you that you understand the role that nutrition plays. Now, um, this this slide, this or this section, is not intended to be like a comprehensive review of all the nutritional literatures around uh, nutrient deficiencies and their relationship with blood pressure. But I just wanted to show you a couple of things. So here, it, in this this particular case, this is on vitamin D. It's a systematic review meta analysis of studies on vitamin D. And the conclusion is the meta-analysis of the epidemiological studies disclosed that serum vitamin D concentrations are inversely related to the risk of high blood pressure, HT and hypertension, in adults in a dose-response manner in both prospective cohort and cross-sectional studies. But what does that mean? The lower your vitamin D, the greater your risk of developing high blood pressure. The higher your vitamin D, the less risk of developing high blood pressure. So again, major review on vitamin D. Uh, I think vitamin D is very critical for several reasons. And one of the side effects of vitamin D, the healthy side effects of vitamin D is that it increases calcium absorption, right? So no vitamin D, you, you don't get good calcium absorption. What did we say a minute ago about calcium? It's one of the electrolytes that regulates the contractility of your blood vessels. So if you don't have enough of it, you know, it's a double whammy. And this is one of the reasons why vitamin D is so critical because it plays a role not just in and of itself, but also with the calcium. I, I pulled this from the website of Mount Sinai, which is a, a major medical hospital system. And so this was just a, on their own website. And I, I always like to take, especially from mainstream hospital systems, when they're saying it, uh, you know it's a problem because usually they won't say it. And so in this case, they were saying it, but on, this is about CoQ10. And it's interesting, I share a little anecdotal story with you about CoQ10. Uh, let's read this first. But in one analysis, after reviewing 12 clinical studies, researchers concluded that CoQ10 has the potential to lower systolic blood pressure. Systolic is that top number by up to 17 points, 17 millimeters per uh, uh, mercury and diastolic blood pressure by 10 uh, millimeters of mercury without significant side effects. So again, here's a substance in research that can lower your top number by up to 17 points, your bottom number by up to 10 points without any side effects. So why aren't doctors pulling for this first? Why aren't doctors testing for CoQ10 deficiency on a regular basis? It just doesn't happen across the board accurately, even though this therapeutic, CoQ10, has the potential to dramatically reduce blood pressure without side effects. And then we have this from science, and that's blood pressure and nutrient intake in the U.S. And so this is just a major, you know, major analysis that showed significant decreases in the consumption of calcium, potassium, vitamin A, and vitamin C were identified as the nutritional factors that distinguished hypertensive from normotensive subject, subjects. In other words, people that ate less foods that contain, or people that ate foods that contain less calcium, potassium, vitamin A, and vitamin C were identified as people that were more likely to have high blood pressure. And then they go on to say lower calcium intake was the most consistent factor in hypertension and in, in high blood pressure individuals. Across the population, higher intakes of calcium, potassium, and get this, I really want to put a circle here because everybody always hears about sodium being so bad for you, right? Um, but here's what they find is that low calcium, potassium, and sodium were associated with lower mean systolic blood pressure and lower absolute risk of hypertension, meaning that you got to eat enough sodium. And we've gone away from that. And, our, and you know, what is the mainstream, kind of the mainstream mantra with blood pressure? It's reduce salt, right? Well, what is salt? Salt is sodium. And, and so doctors nowadays, this is what they say, and, and they, don't, they don't clarify, we need salt. Like salt is super important. You don't want to not have salt in your diet. Now, the difference is if you're eating all processed food, if you're on a processed food diet, you understand that you're not really getting real salt. You're getting, uh, basically you're getting 
chemically manipulated salt, predominantly in the form of monosodium glutamate, which is not the same thing as salt. You can eat nice pink Himalayan or, or pink salt. You can take in nice sea salt, perfectly fine, perfectly healthy. But when you're eating all those processed junk foods, what you're getting is this MSG, and this is a big part of what's gonna elevate your blood pressure. And one of the reasons why that glutamate aspect of MSG is actually an excitotoxin. So it stimulates the sympathetic nervous system and turns it up, ramps it up. But it's not salt that causes high blood pressure. Salt does help your kidneys retain water, but it's important, right? If you have good balance of potassium and sodium, magnesium and calcium, then your kidneys will retain the right amount of water without holding on to so much that it leads to elevations in pressure. But it's important you understand that salt is a critical part of regulating your electrolyte balance as well. Now, I wanna talk a little bit about the corruption in the numbers of blood pressure. I think it's important to draw a couple of things to your attention. So before we dive into, the, into these um, papers here, let's talk a little bit about, I'm gonna move them out of the way. Let's talk about a little bit about what it means to have high blood pressure. So for those of you that may not, may or may not know, right, systolic, is the top number and diastolic is the bottom number. So generally when doctor says your blood pressure, for example, is 120 over 80, that 120 would be the top, that diastolic would be the 80, right? The bottom number. And what's the difference between systolic and diastolic? Systolic is the, qu the quantity of pressure on your vascular tree when your heart is not at rest, right? When your heart is contracting, versus the diastolic is your heart at rest. And that's why the numbers are different. One of the, one of the pressures is while the muscle's contracted, the other is when, the, when it's at rest. And so the number that we're most concerned about as it relates to like dangerous blood pressure is really this one. This one is harder to change. Um, it's harder to change acutely, meaning, meaning for example, um, this number is going to stay relatively the same, that bottom number. This top number is going to change quite acutely. So like if you were to do 10 jumping jacks, your top number on your blood pressure would go up just like that. It would go up very fast, right? So the diastolic doesn't change quickly. The systolic can change very, very quickly, but it should also recover quickly. So like if you were doing exercise and it went up, it should recover relatively quickly if you sat down. Now, systolic over diastolic, again, this is how your doctor is measuring your blood pressure. Uh, in, in how they're thinking about it. Now, the range for systolic is supposed to be 100 to 140. And this, is, this is what the range has been. It's been this way for years, although recently in the last couple of decades, there have been some changes in these numbers uh, and there have been a creation of something called prehypertension, which we'll talk about in a minute. The diastolic numbers, the normal range is between 60 and 90, right? So if you fall, um, you know, again, going back 20 years ago, if you if you would have fallen within this range on your top number and within this range on your bottom number, your doctor would have said, hey, you know what? You don't have a problem. We don't need to medicate you or you don't need to eat right and exercise, right? Your pressure's fine. Now, there are caveats to this. For example, let's say that your blood pressure, as long as you've measured it, has always been 120. And then on the, on the top and always been 80 on the bottom. And then one day you go to your doctor's office and all of a sudden it's different, right? It started to change. Now that top is reading more like 135 and that bottom's reading like 88, okay? Now that would fall within the range of normal. Again, it wouldn't be your normal because you have a history of something much lower than that. So then the question should be by your doctor to you, what is different in your life? What has changed? Um, that is driving this up and there should be an investigation into that why. So again, um, there's nuance to this. But what's happened in the last number of years, and this was, this was reported um, this was reported in the newspaper. So you see the title of this is New Blood Pressure Guidelines Pay Off for drug companies. And I, I commend the reporter for actually writing an article because this is really hard. This is hard to do nowadays with so much, all the censorship that we've been getting. But this is, it was this, when the, the invention of prehypertension happened 
here, right? And this was um, 2005 when this originally happened. So again, we're going back almost 20 years, but behind. So, so what happened? There were different panels um, that were getting together, okay, to reclassify the reference range for blood pressure. So again, that reference range is 100 to 140 and 60 to 90 on the bottom. So what happened? Um, behind each of those panels were the giant pharmaceutical companies that manufacture the new and expensive high blood pressure drugs. Okay, so in May 2003, for example, a National Institute of Health panel recommended broader use of hypertension drugs at lower blood pressures. Nine of the 11 authors of the guidelines had ties to the drug companies. That means there were 11 doctors nine of them had ties to the drug company, meaning financial ties, they were being paid, meaning they had conflict of interest or bias uh, as it related to, they should, in my opinion, they should never have been allowed to be on the panel. The, the National Institute of Health should have had the ethics to say, no, you're, you're automatically disqualified because you're being paid by the drug company. We can't qualify you to create new numbers, again, over here, because that is a conflict of interest and you might not be making the best decision, right? There's that possibility. People are, are influenced, definitely influenced by money. So the drug industry welcomed the new treatment guidelines. So this, these were new treatment guidelines. This is again, what created prehypertension. So what's prehypertension? They took the range of 130 to 139 on the top and they said now, from now on, this is prehypertension. Okay, and, they, and then they said that you should start medicine in this range now, right? So what that really did is it took the quantity of people who had real high blood pressure, right? Who really truly had a problem, which you know in the US is about one third of the adult population and it increased it to almost half of the population. So now what does that do to the bottom line of a pharmaceutical company? When you change the, again, you change the playing field, right? Because we're not saying people are really sicker here. We're just recreating or medicinalizing a normal range, right? And we're doing it under the influence of, of definitely under the influence of pharmacy, right? And so here's what it did. Last year, patients and their insurance companies spent $16.3 billion for blood pressure pills, which was an amount that was $3 billion higher from five years earlier as a result of this guideline. In essence, this guideline, which was influenced by doctors who were being paid by pharmaceutical companies, increased pharmaceutical revenue $3 billion. That's a lot of money. I mean, how can you say that it's not an influence? Anyway, it's a conflict of interest, a, a huge conflict of interest, and you should be aware of these types of conflicts of interest and you should bring them up with your doctor. You should converse about these conflicts of interests with your doctor because your doctor oftentimes doesn't even know that these conflicts are there. He's just following a guideline. And here's, here's another example of that. So the, you know, this was published in the Journal of General Family Medicine. This is just a few years old. Over diagnosis or not, the 2017 ACCAHA High Blood Pressure Clinical Practice Guidelines. So in essence, again, groups of doctors got together and they said, we're going to change the guidelines on what is high blood pressure and what is not. Again, so in this case, American Heart Association, American College of Cardiology, and nine other professional organizations issued a new hypertension clinical practice guideline. Now, these are guidelines. These are basically, think of these as pamphlets that they're forwarding on to all the other doctors to say, this is what we recommend as a professional association that you do with your patients. And again, I, as I read this to you, so this was November 2017, which has lowered the hypertension threshold to 130 over 80. So now, again, we said over here, we said this is pre-hypertension at 130 to 139. Now they're taking it one step further, right? Let's lower the hypertension threshold to 130 over 80. The American Academy of Family Medicine has decided not to endorse this new guideline for various reasons, including flaws uh, in the development process and a limited additional benefit for lowering or for lower treatment targets. In other words, there's no additional benefit if you start medicine, you know, here versus this 140 or higher number. And so their biggest concern, their major concern was the intellectual conflict of interest, right? The new threshold would lead to 46% of the U.S. adult population 
being categorized as having hypertension while using the previous threshold that figure would be 32 percent should we call this change as over diagnosis in other words their concern the the you know again you had you have you have groups like the American Heart Association, which is very famous in this country, uh, in American College of Cardiology, and, and, and nine other professional groups were creating new guidelines saying, we want to lower blood pressure um, reference ranges so that people are being called hypertensive even earlier, right? Even though there's huge conflict of interest. And one group, the American Academy of Family Medicine, stood up, thank God, stood up and said, no, we don't endorse that. We believe there's huge conflict of interest and we can't get behind that. However, that, all that being said, many doctors are already behind that and already following with those guidelines. As a matter of fact, if you have been to the doctor and had your blood pressure in that range and were recommended medicine, just raise your hand, chime into the comments and let me know. So again, there's a huge conflict of interest. The numbers, you know, you always say the goalposts keep changing. So it started out here but now the goal, and then the goalposts moved to pre here, and then the goalposts goal post moved again to what would in the past be considered very normal blood pressure, now being called high blood pressure. And what that does is it increases the amount of revenue, potential generation of revenue, and the doctors who are making these guidelines have a con direct conflict of interest tied to the pharmaceutical industry. And you need to be aware of that. Again, it's important that you understand that. How else are you going to make an intelligent decision? if you're faced with high blood pressure and the need to, um, to potentially think about medicine. Now, I also want to show you kind of the paradox of this whole situation, which is when you're looking at high blood pressure and you're, and you're considering medicine, and I'm going to show you here, if you look at this diagram, if we can zoom in on this. So this chart is just a chart of some of the more common drug-induced nutritional deficiencies, meaning medicines have consequences. When you get put on prescription drugs, many of them have uh, the ability to lower or diminish or cause nutritional deficit. And so you can see here for blood pressure and the category of blood pressure, there's a few different categories here. One is the diuretics, you know, furosemide and Lasix, hydrochlorothiazide is a type of diuretic. These drugs lower vitamin b1 vitamin b6 and vitamin c they deplete them now remember what i showed you earlier vitamin b1 deficiency can cause high blood pressure vitamin b6 deficiency there's studies that show that vitamin b6 can lower blood pressure um, up to 10 points in some cases higher right and, and this drug depletes it right and then vitamin c vitamin c is necessary to form that nitric oxide that we were talking about earlier that's the substance that allows your blood vessels to dilate so that they don't become too stiff and rigid so again these very drugs designed to treat the blood pressure problem deplete nutrients that are critical for the regulation of normal blood pressure but then you also have these minerals and these are going to ring a bell magnesium calcium potassium zinc and sodium right all being depleted and then over here on the far right You've got CoQ10, CoQ10, CoQ10. And then you think about that, because as you move through this chart, right, you've got blood pressure medicines, but if you think about it, what other common drugs do people with high blood pressure get put on? One of them is the statins, right? And statins deplete CoQ10. And what else? Diabetic drugs, right? Like glucophage or metformin, right? And that drug depletes CoQ10. And what did we say earlier, that CoQ10 can reduce blood pressure 16 points, right? So here you are, you're on, maybe you're on all three of these. It's very rarely that somebody's on blood pressure medicine in a vacuum. It's usually, it's a combination of the three. And so now you're taking multiple drugs that inhibit CoQ10, that inhibit the minerals that are necessary to regulate blood pressure, and that cause deficiencies of the B vitamins that are also necessary to regulate blood pressure. And so... Now what happens is you're being treated for a disease or a disease risk factor, I should say, uh, that leads to a deficit of key essential nutrients that your body needs to regulate that very same condition. So you end up chasing your tail and actually it's a losing battle because you never catch it. And so it actually can lead to even bigger problems, more problems. As I mentioned earlier, if you're on a blood pressure diuretic and it depletes your B1. B1 deficiency, not only can it contribute to high blood pressure, but it can cause congestive heart failure. 
B6 deficiency can cause an elevation in homocysteine that increases your risk for a heart attack. It increases your risk for a stroke. Vitamin C deficiency increases your risk for vascular damage. It increases your risk for atherosclerosis. Again, the very diseases, the very cardiovascular diseases the doctors are trying to prevent you from developing through pharmacological intervention create the same diseases through different mechanisms by depleting nutritional status. And that's what puts you in a very serious predicament. And that's why I want you to know this because you need to be able to have that conversation with your doctor. This is true, uh, this is true informed consent, if you will. How many of you have ever been told that the drugs that your doctor wants to put you on deplete nutrients that your body needs to prevent these very diseases? True informed consent would be the doctor sitting down saying, yes, I want to put you on this diuretic, but I think the risk of the diuretic outweighs, or the benefit of the diuretic outweighs the risk of causing these nutritional deficiencies. And now you at least have had an open, honest conversation and you can make the best decision for yourself. But if you never are privy to this information, you don't even have a basis by which to judge. You're just going in and trusting that your doctor has your best interest, not realizing that he probably doesn't even know this. Right? This, is, this, is, this is information that I can promise you does not get taught in medical school. It doesn't get taught. Um, and it's unfortunate because there are about five textbooks on the topic. They just are not textbooks that are required reading in medicine. So all that being said, hopefully you learned something tonight. And if you find this information helpful, make sure you pass it on to somebody that you love. I want to take now, we're going to start taking on some of these questions. Is there, a question, or is there a connection between AFib and high blood pressure? There can be. So a lot of people develop AFib because they're mineral deficiencies. So calcium, magnesium deficiencies can contribute to AFib and also high blood pressure. So the connection uh, can be similar, especially as it relates to nutrition deficit. Um, can gluten cause AFib? Uh, question. Yes, gluten can cause AFib. I've seen it go away in a number of people after changing their diet from gluten containing to gluten free. What's a healthy heart rate range while sitting out in the sun and blood pressure too? So a healthy heart rate, so like your rate of your pulse, if you're talking about pulse rate, uh, if you're just relaxing, Anywhere probably between a healthy person, again, healthy adult, somewhere between 60 and 80. If it's pushing up over that, then it's probably because of deconditioning of the muscles. Um, but good, healthy pulse somewhere between 60 and 80 if you're just relaxing. As far as blood pressure, I think I gave you those ranges already. Uh, let's see here. I have... You know, yeah, let's see. Not a question. How can you naturally lower... Uh, Deanne, not sure, do you mean mean platelet volume? Is, are you referring to MPV as mean, pla mean platelet volume uh, because it increased after COVID? So naturally, what can you do to support healthy platelet volume post-COVID? Take, um, I have something called Matrozyme, and it's a proteolytic enzyme that supports healthy blood viscosity, and so that would be something that uh, I, would, I would encourage you to look into. We can put that link in the feed on, uh, on I think it's on Facebook. Um, is low blood pressure dangerous? Mine is 101 over 70, uh, but I take Percocet painkillers every day. I mean, that, that's not low, first of all, that's not low blood pressure. And I would imagine that Percocet is driving your systolic number down. Um, you know, it's, it's, when, you, when you're talking about dangerous, what, what happens when blood pressure gets too low is people will try to stand up from a seated position and they can pass out or they can get super, super dizzy and it can make it, you know, it can make it dangerous for a potential fall. Um, so if, that, if that's something that's happening, you know, that's where you really want to talk to your doctor and get it diagnosed because there are a number of different reasons why it can happen. Certainly certain medications that... Um, that lower stress or, or in, impede on the stress mechanism, uh, including pain medications, can have that effect. Uh, let's see, Angeline says, I was able to reverse my high blood sugar and high blood pressure with a keto diet, but I went from carb overload to fat toxicity and I don't digest fat anymore. Um, you gotta come back more to normalcy. I've talked about that a lot. Um, a lot of people 
will go from one extreme to another. So they'll go from, you know, from carb heavy to fat heavy, right? And so the one diet on in this situation, going from carb toxic to fat heavy, it was a solution, a short-term solution for the carbohydrate toxicity. But in the long run, it didn't really, uh, it didn't really create health because it just created another imbalance in the direction of high fat. So you've got to come back more toward the middle, Angeline. I'd like the rule of thirds. A third of your calories should come from carbs, a third from fat, a third from protein. And that might get you where you want to be. How can I prevent headaches caused by air pressure changes? Um, there's a lot of things that can be done with air pressure changes. And one of them, one of the things that I see that's super common is that the, um, the sinuses are com impacted or the sinuses are full of mucus. And so when there's air pressure change, the internal head pressure is greater and that can generate a headache. So one of the things, if you haven't already followed up with, with your doc is, is talk about sinuses. Um, you know, there are, there are a number of different formulas that can support healthy sinus release or sinus drainage. Um, NAC, N-acetylcysteine, is one of the nutrients that is very, very effective at helping support sinus clearing. Um, but we have a product called Ultra Sinus Support. Um, normal blood pressure, but elevated heart rate, okay? You know, yes and no. I, I would I would argue if your heart rate's elevated, it's because your heart's deconditioned, and and that can be. In my opinion, in the long run, that can be potential danger for you as well. So, I, you know, Jeff, I don't, I don't know what kind of physical capacity or physical shape that you're in, or what kind of exercise that you do, but that may be the answer for your pulse, for your blood, uh, for your heart rate. Um, what are the blood tests to run for high blood pressure? There aren't any blood tests to run for high blood pressure per se. What you do is you have a blood pressure cuff, or what's known as a sphygmomanometer. And that's what you use to measure your blood pressure. And uh, one of the other things I really didn't talk about yet tonight, I'm not going to get into it because I've got a training video on it. And we'll, we can put that link up below this video, but um, how to properly take blood pressure. Because one of the other issues that I commonly see is somebody will go to their doctor's office and their blood pressure will have been improperly taken. Um, whether it was by a nurse or a staff member, they took the blood pressure incorrectly and got an artificially elevated reading. And then that person was put on medicine, even though their blood pressure wasn't actually high. I, I've seen that a number of times. Uh, and so anyway, what, we have a video tutorial on how to properly take blood pressure because it's got to be done right or you can get falsely elevated readings. Um, I have super normal tyrosine levels, so elevated tyrosine levels, lowered them with vitamin C, helped a lot, blood pressure's improved, but weight hasn't decreased. Any ideas being checked for hyperthyroidism? I mean, I would get a full checkup, get a full workup, and see if there's anything else physiologically going on, Juan. Um, just, just because it's a smart idea, if you've got that kind of problem, that, that needs to be looked at and investigated more deep. Um, Optimal amount of omega-3 is DHA, EPA for an adult. It's, it's, so I'm going to give you a generalized answer for that because it's not like an optimal. It's not a one-size-fits-all. For most adults, two grams of concentrated omega-3 a day with a, uh, almost an equivalent mixture of EPA and DHA. Again, this is a generalized answer. Uh, so about two grams a day with a good mix between EPA and DHA. So about a gram each of both. Uh, can hyperinsulinemia cause kidney ducts to pinch, causing hypertension? Well, hyperinsulinemia, when your insulin's too high, it's, it's not that the insulin is causing a problem per se, is that the insulin is part of the problem. The insulin being elevated is almost always due to insulin resistance, which means Insulin's not communicating to the insulin receptor effectively lowering, you know, and regulating blood glucose. And that can lead, and that can be caused by, I should say, a number of different things. It can be caused by zinc deficiency, chromium deficiency, vitamin B3 deficiency. Uh, so again, you know, always start, you should always start when you're working with your doctor, always start measuring your nutrition status. Nutrients are essential. Your body can't function without them. It's always the first place that you should start. 
Blood pressure medicines are not essential. They're chemicals designed to fool your body or trick your body. You're, you're basically, you're forcing your body in a direction. And anytime you force somebody to do something, right? Anytime you force something, there's always a reaction, right? <laughs> your body physiochemically will have a different kind of reaction. And, and you know, you don't want to induce those reactions because, uh, because they're not good in the long haul. Would potassium citrate be good for high blood pressure? Doc said, I am dehydrated, but I am under a lot of stress too. I mean, if you're, if you're deficient in potassium, potassium citrate is a good form of potassium to take. What's a healthy heart rate range while sitting? I think I answered that one already. Um, three to four, I drink three to four cups of coffee a day. Um, yeah, that's too much in my opinion. I think you're, you're probably pushing yourself a little too hard. Let's see here. So somebody's asking about an enlar enlarged um, in in inferior vena cava, what can cause that? You know, if you've got a dilatated vessel, it may be congenital. It's hard to say. Congenital meaning um, you're born with it, but there could also be other factors that, that put pressure on the vascular um, vasculature and and create dilatations in it. Is it. There's a lot of things, but vascular weakness. I mean, for example, vitamin C can contribute to vascular weakness that can lead to some of those dilatations. It, it, there's a lot of possibilities with that. Yeah, so why are the lab value thresholds for geriatric population versus a general population? Um, seniors are usually victim of polypharmacy. I, look, I've seen so much. I was going to share. I didn't share it. I started to share it. I, I, I think it's just my personal opinion. I, you know, I'm not, I'm not, point, not going to point any fingers. I'm not going to say all doctors are bad or all, all people in healthcare are bad. But I have seen a general trend of nefar and nefarious behavior in in medicine and even in lab um, evolve over the past 21 years. One of the things that I was involved with years ago was a, a research study um, down at the University uh, of Texas in one of the hospital systems there. Uh, they wanted me to be involved in a study on congestive heart failure. And it, they didn't want me involved because I'm a smart guy. They wanted me involved because they wanted to use me. They wanted me to donate my CoQ10 to the research study. Um, the problem was when I showed up to talk to the cardiologist who, who had written the study, you know, the study parameters, uh, you know, I showed up and I said, why did you write the study parameters so that they would fail? In essence, this was a study where um, they wanted to use CoQ10, a therapeutic dose of CoQ10 to see if it affected or improved a person's congestive heart failure. The problem was they were only using 30 milligrams of CoQ10. That's the dose that they wanted to use. And I'm like, 30 milligrams is an ineffective dose. Um, you know, it's like, it's like peeing on a forest fire. There's not gonna be any impact or effect at that dose. Why did you write the study to fail? And, and I knew they had written the study to fail because the research is very clear. Any cardiologist who reads any of their own literature knows that 30 milligrams of CoQ10 is an insignificant amount of CoQ10 to give to a therapeutic diseased patient. Yet they wrote the study with 30 milligrams as their dose anyway. And so when I challenged them on it, they didn't have a good answer. They, matter of fact, they turned beet red, they turned bright red, I, like I'd caught them, right? Hands in the cookie jar. Um, and basically, I, I, obviously, I, I didn't donate my CoQ10 to that study because it didn't want to play a role in, in lending credence to false information. So what they were after was they were after publishing a study that showed CoQ10 was not effective with treatment of congestive heart failure, but that would have been a false study because they designed a parameter that was destined to fail. And this is a lot of times what happens in medical research where it's done on purpose. You know, where they used what they know is an inadequate dose um, to have an, a meaningful impact or meaningful effect. We see this in a lot of the research on vitamin D and blood pressure too, where they use in, ineffective doses and their conclusion is vitamin D has no impact on blood pressure. And it's like, 
why did you use an ineffective dose? Like there's already research studies that show that the doses have to be at a certain level. So why are you studying something that we know is just gonna generate a trial uh, or a body of evidence that, that says that this substance doesn't work? And when you hand that over to a news reporter who doesn't understand biochemistry or dosing, and they now blast that all over the news for a month, CoQ10 ineffective for congestive heart failure study says, right? Or vitamin D increases the risk for you know, for major problems, uh, or vitamin E increases the risk for cancer, right? These little sound bites that get blasted on the news media because the news media don't do their job anymore. Like investigative reporters are basically their mouthpieces for industry, uh, for industries that pay them. Instead of being true journalists and true reporters, they don't really care about the truth. They want the sound bite. They want the, they want the glorify whatever message it is, they want to glorify what they're being paid to get across and they're not really investigative anymore. And so we just don't want, I mean, again, that's not damning all reporters. There are good reporters out there too. But that's the way that the system works and that's part of how it's corrupted. And what we've seen in the last number of years is we've seen reference ranges be normalized toward disease. And perfect example of that is if you look at blood sugar reference ranges. When 21 years ago, when I started practice, normal blood glucose was between 60 and 90. Today, normal blood glucose for most labs is somewhere between 65 and 119. Well, why 119? That's almost 20 points higher. That's in my opinion, that's diabetic. Um, so why would we allow for a reference range that normalizes the presence of diabetes? It doesn't make any sense that that, that would be the case. It's because the population is becoming more and more um, sick. And so we're normalizing illness. Uh, we see this, we see, that trend, but then we see the opposite trends. Like with cholesterol, we saw that normal was at 250, then it went to 220, then it went to 200, right? And if you look at the, the same parameters happened with cholesterol as with blood pressure, is that each one of those groups of doctors that were basically, that were hired by our government to reanalyze re what the level should be, you know, well, what did we find over and over again? Conflict of interest. The doctors were being directly paid by the pharmaceutical companies. And even though that conflict of interest existed, the FDA grants them a waiver and says, we're going to allow you to make these decisions anyway. And what does it do? It makes, you know, this many millions of more people eligible to take that particular medication to the tune of this amount more of profit, right? Without concern for whether or not that would even be effective um, or whether that would even be safe. We see the same thing on a massive scale. I think, I think many people are waking up to it. We saw it play out over the last two years, you know, with the disease that shall not be named where everything was all about, you know, safe and effective. And now that it turns out that we have, you know, a, a year plus of data, it's not safe and effective at all. It doesn't even work. Um, okay. Does the, uh, Mary wants to know, does your B complete supplement cover all those B nutrients to ensure a person would be okay and not deficient? It, it, it's a good place to start, Mary, but without testing, it's hard to know. I've seen cases where people were, um, you know, were taking good B complex, but they still came back deficient in a B vitamin. So again, testing should be the gold standard of what you use to understand it, but it's a good place to start to ensure that you're getting support. What if you have CDK, chronic, I'm gonna assume you mean CKD, Sue, um, chronic kidney disease? I, I, I assume that that's what you mean because your reference is, what if you have CDK, will the calcium cause more stones? Generally speaking, um, in chronic kidney disease, calcium does not cause stones. Calcium binding to other components can cause stones. So like in the example of classic kidney stone, it's oxalate binds to calcium and can precipitate out and form stones. Just because you have chronic kidney disease doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to develop stones from calcium use. I think a lot of, um, a lot of people have that fear and it's, it's, it's an unwarranted fear. I think more than anything with chronic kidney disease, you wanna make sure that you're not becoming dehydrated. Um, but I wouldn't have a fear of using calcium in somebody with chronic kidney disease. Does a person's blood pressure naturally get a bit higher when you have gone through menopause? It can, and one of the reasons why is the loss of muscle mass. As women go through menopause and lose some of their sex steroid hormone power, their muscles can atrophy a certain extent, and that can be a cause of elevations in blood pressure. So 
So Barbara's 65-year-old female blood pressure used to be 120 over 65, reduced meat, dairy, and gluten intake, and increased veggies, fruit, legumes, nuts for a year. It's been 108 over 57. Should it change anything? Sounds like you're doing pretty good, Barbara. I, I would just suggest getting checked nutritionally. If you've backed down on meat, meat is, a, you know, depending, you know, some people can do this and be okay. Others cannot, but meat's a, a source of B12. B12 is necessary to keep your homocysteine in check, which we talked about tonight. Uh, it's also so, uh, a great source of B6, which can help with blood pressure. It's a great source of zinc and methionine and, and uh, other critical amino acids for overall health. So, you know, measuring some things in your, during your checkup would be a good idea. But again, it sounds like you're doing well. Mary says, would it be wrong to think that this could be driven by the drug industry? Seriously? I mean, I don't think it would be wrong to think that. I think you always have to look at potential conflict of interests. And I know you're saying that sarcastically, Mary. Yeah, so somebody said, I had my blood pressure, my, my visit done, was told I had prehypertension with a 137 over 79, exactly what you said. I've started your CalMag product now, plus your be complete. So if you've started those, the other thing, I mean, remember what... We, we talk about diet and lifestyle and lowering blood pressure. So what does that look like? That means get sunshine every day. That means get eight hours of sleep. Um, you go to bed, but at least sleeping between the hours of 10 and 2, preferably longer, but that's 10 p.m. to 2 a.m. You know, exercise regularly to your ability to tolerate exercise. You don't have to be super aggressive with it, but you do need that motion and that movement. Uh, and that's a little different for everyone. And if you're not quite sure you're, or you're... Um, you're a little nervous about it, hire a professional to help you and to teach you kind of how to exercise. Learn, you can watch videos on YouTube or you can hire a professional to work with you one-on-one, -on -one, but it's important that you do those other things. Those other things are going to help tremendously if you're trying to get your blood pressure down. You know, Rose comments, um, hydrochlorothiazide is handed out like candy. I, I, I see that in my, in my um, practice as well. Yeah, I know. My parents always told me to stay away from drugs, too. Yet here we are in America where the average person 45 or older is on five or more medications. It's sickening uh, to think that, you know, it, it really it's disgusting. I'm, I'm going to deviate for just a minute. Um, in healthcare, the U.S. is ranked, I think it's 11th uh, out of major industrialized nations. That's last. Um, yet we, we use more medicines and we spend more money than any of these countries and we're ranked last. Like, what does that tell you empirically? If you're really just looking at the situation from the outside in and you're looking at us as a culture and you're saying, these people spend more money on drugs and surgeries and medical procedures than any country in the world, $4.2 trillion a year, and they enjoy the worst cases of chronic disease of any other country in the world. What does that tell you? It tells you the system is broken. Um, so why are we doing it? Why do we keep going? Why do we keep doing the same thing? Why are doctors so resistant to change? Why are hospitals and, and uh, the medical professionals so resistant to change? What they're doing is obviously not working. And so they want to do more of the same. Only now they want to socialize it and steal tax dollars. You know, like, like I paid, you know, I would rather carry no insurance personally. This is just my own personal anecdote, but if I could carry zero insurance for health, I would, because I don't believe that the system is, is capable of helping me. Um, and so what I would really be paying for is nothing. Um, I'd be paying to have a $30 copay to talk to a doctor who knows nothing about health. And that to me is not a value. And so I would rather take that money and I would rather put it in, in, a, in a health savings account or a bank account somewhere where in case I did have a true medical need, a true medical emergency where our medical system really does shine, which is in the emergency rooms and the acute care trauma centers, if I really truly had that need, I could, I could preserve what I'm throwing away every year for premiums to not use them, which is, you know, for most of you probably in maybe in a similar situation, but for my family, it's thousands of dollars a year, thousands and thousands of dollars a year that I have to pay to put into a system that is completely broken, doesn't work. It steals for me to drive treatment as a healthcare right for other individuals who don't take care of themselves and then go seek out treatment that also doesn't work when, when they seek that treatment out. It's totally backwards. Anyway, thanks for allowing me to vent that. Um,
Is taking daily first thing in the morning uh, a teeth of garlic chopped and placed in less than four ounces of water helps in maintaining healthy blood pressure? So in other words, does taking garlic help with blood pressure? For some it does, Elizabeth. There's, there's actually some pretty good research on garlic use and blood pressure. So um, question about magnesium. You mentioned magnesium, which type? Oxide, chloride, citrate, etc. Which would be best for lowering blood pressure? Oxide's probably the worst. Chloride, probably the second worst. Citrate and other amino acid chelates would be better options. You know, glycinate is an example of another type of magnesium. Um, you're looking for, typically you're looking for what's called a Krebs cycle chelate with magnesium. Those are just better absorbed by the body and better utilized by the body than your oxides or chlorides. Can I give you an example of a calcium channel blocker that can lead to polypharmacy over time? Sure. Um, so you get it, let's just say you get on a calcium channel blocker. Um, what happens next? Well, one of the things that happens is your CoQ10 starts to drop. CoQ10 deficiency contributes to congestive heart failure, contributes to hypertension, contributes to chronic pain, because CoQ10 deficiency leads to muscle myalgias and neuropathy. So this could be muscle or nerve. Um, you also have the fact that CoQ10 deficiency can contribute to loss of kidney function, so reduction in kidney function. So now, okay, let's just fast forward five years. You're on this beta or calcium channel blocker. This is all happening to you to some degree or another. So what does the doctor want to do? They want to add a blood pressure medication. Maybe now instead of just a calcium channel blocker, they want to add a diuretic. Right, so you get on the diuretic. So they add the diuretic, and now the diuretic starts to work over your magnesium and your calcium and your potassium and your vitamin B1, but diuretics also cause CoQ10 deficiency. So now your CoQ10 deficiency is worsening, then your kidney failure is worsening, and so now they want to preserve your kidney function by adding another blood pressure medicine, but then they also, because, because their, their fear is that cardiovascular disease will increase the risk for chronic kidney disease to progressively go forward, they may even actually also add a statin, right? And statins, of course, reduce CoQ10 again. And so now you're on a statin, you're on two different blood pressure medications, and maybe from, from the chronic nerve pain, they've got you over here now starting on gabapentin, right? And then the gabapentin, causes your GI tract peristalsis to slow down. So now you develop IBS. And so now they want to add an IBS medication, right? And IBS medications can cause a number of problems, but one of them creates mood issues. And so now they want you on sertraline or an SSRI. You could see where this is going. It's, it's, it's polypharmacy is when a doctor tries to force chemical manipulate the wisdom of your body in a direction that it doesn't want to go. Your body's symptoms are not a disease. This is the, the myth of medicine, in my opinion. Symptoms aren't a disease. Conglomerations of symptoms aren't disease or syndromes. Symptoms are your body's way of communicating to you that you need to make a damn change. And if you ignore those symptoms or you suppress those symptoms using pharmacy, then your body will just figure out a way around it and it will create new symptoms for you um, and you'll also pay a cost because now as you add polypharmacy, you're picking up symptoms that your body's not having necessarily to try to warn you that you're having symptoms as a result of introduction of toxins, which is what drugs are. They are chemical manipulating toxins that are trying to force your body in a direction it doesn't want to go, all because you refuse to listen to your original symptoms and, and you decided not to take active behavioral change. The drug is a passive change. It's something, something you take that does the work for you. I mean, most people are just generally speaking. And again, you know, if you take offense to this, I apologize. Not really though. 
most people are generally lazy. They don't want to take the action steps that are necessary to be healthy because it disrupts the convenience of their lifestyle. Exercise, making it a priority, disrupts the convenience of what you want to do, right? Going to bed on time disrupts. Maybe you want to stay up and play a video game or, or stay up and watch TikToks or whatever, you know, whatever that looks like in, in your life. But you, when you disrupt your convenience and neglect your health, there's only one way forward, and that's either polypharmacy, right, or the development of symptoms because your body is just trying to communicate to you. And again, if you, if you take a pause and you listen to your body, and you start asking, why are these symptoms there? And don't rely on somebody else who's never met you and who's only spending three minutes with you to give you the discernation of why you're sick or why you're struggling. Like, you know the answer. You just have to pick your head up out of the sand and pay attention and listen, right? And, and again, maybe that sounds a little bit harsh, but that is the true reality is it become more in tune with yourself and you, you follow basic fundamentals to get health. And these tenants have not changed in hundreds of thousands of years of human life. And those tenants are very simple. You have to move your body. You have to rest your body. You have to mitigate your stress. You need clean water. You need clean air. And you need clean food. And if you have those things in place and you start from that as a foundation, then oftentimes you'll find that pharmacy is an unnecessary thing, right? But again, they don't want you to know that. Doctors don't spend enough time to teach you that, right? So you have to then empower yourself. And that's why you're here tonight. You're here tonight because you're trying to empower yourself. So, you know, at any rate, I hope that that was helpful, that tangent. Um, If salt is so demonized by Western medicine, why do they give saline IV fluids at hospitals? Because they are trying to rehydrate you. That's all. It's standard care. It's standard practice. Um, <laughs> Dr. Osborne, can you please be my doctor? Call my office. Um, you know, I always say real doctors are always taking on new people because the people they're taking on are getting better. Um, doctors that close their practice and don't have room for more people, in my opinion, is because they're not successful in the endeavor of helping people. They're super successful in the endeavor of managing people's medications and keeping those medications managed over long periods of time, which does zero to serve the individual. But a true doctor serves the individual at the highest level, which is self-empowerment through education. And if our, and if our medical system focused on that, all the hospitals would close down. I mean, we wouldn't have, you know, Vegas-like skyscraper scenes in every major city of all these specialized hospital buildings with thousands and thousands of doctors who, um, you know, who go about their day medicating and managing medications. Is it safe to take um, the vitamins in the CoQ10 if you're on blood pressure meds? It's absolutely safe, um, Fio. It's very, very safe to take them concomitantly. Yeah, but always, always, always check with the manufacturer of your drug and make sure that your drug, if it's to be taken with food or on an empty stomach, that you take it properly in that regard. But it's no, there's no imperative danger to taking vitamins or CoQ10 with medication. Any suggestions about what to use if you have Lyme, alpha-gal, high blood pressure, high cholesterol? Well, if you've got Lyme, you've got to get that taken care of. If you've got alpha-gal, if you get your Lyme taken care of, you should be able to, to consume meat in your future. Um, but you got to get you got to get help for the core of it. And I would even argue, do you have Lyme? I mean, I've seen so many people who thought they had Lyme or, or read somewhere that, you know, they matched their symptoms to the symptoms of Lyme, but really didn't. Um, Let's see, keep going down the left. What type of magnesium is, I think I answered that. Magnesium three and eight, so Christine's asking about magnesium three and eight. It's, it crosses the, you know, in terms of giving a magnesium to replete a magnesium deficiency um, because magnesium three and eight can also tend to make people snoozy and sleepy. Um, it's, it's really a good, great source of magnesium to go to bed at night. So if you were you know, struggling with sleep because you were stressed out and you wanted to calm down at night, magnesium 3 and 8 is one of the best forms to take for that sleep. 
I have something called clear mag, which is a form of magnesium 3 and 8. Let's go down a little bit more. So Jean wants to know, besides eating more salt, how else can I raise my blood pressure, my blood pressure, which is low? My functional medicine doctor advised me to raise it. That's a huge question to unpack, Jean, because there's just so many different variables and why your blood pressure might be low. I can't speak for what, why or what your functional medicine doctor has told you or done or analyzed. But in my experience, a lot of people who have really, really low blood pressure have adrenal problems. And so, you know, you know, you might talk with your doctor about analyzing and looking at your adrenal function to see if there's something going on there. Um, I've also seen cases where people's blood pressure was super low because they were taking high levels of magnesium, too much magnesium. So, I mean, there's just a, a lot of potential possibility there. And I would just encourage you to have a much more in-depth conversation with your doc about other, other things to analyze and think about. So Donna wants to know, I take a B-complex, is that sufficient or do I need to take B1 and B6 separately? It depends, Donna. I mean, with B1, one of the best forms of B1 to take in this situation is something called um, benfotiamine, which is a fat-soluble form of vitamin B1. I have a product called Ultra B1 which contains that type of B1. My B complete does not contain that type of B1. So if you're talking about getting your B1 up, um, really, if you've got a major case of B1 deficiency, you, you probably want to look at benfotiamine as a better option. Does lifting weights cause blood pressure to rise? Yes, but acutely. This is the paradox of weightlifting, right? Is that initially, acutely after the workout, your blood pressure goes up but when it recovers, but over the long haul, your blood pressure is lower because you're building lean mass and you're releasing hormones and chemicals that help regulate blood pressure. So this is why exercise is so critical and important. Okay, what time is it? it I'm hungry, so I know it's late, 7.25. So I think I got a lot of these questions answered. If I didn't get to you, um, get her earlier next time. We'll be here, um, again, we're here every Monday night, unless it's a holiday, um, for Pig Dr. Osborne's Brain. I would encourage you, if you haven't already, go and check out my, um, go and check out my newsletter. It's absolutely free, no charge to you. You go over to glutenfreesociety.org and just, if you're not signed up, sign up there. It's one way you can ensure that you'll receive my information without the censorship of mainstream media. Additionally, we're doing some really different and unique things. We're going to be doing some huge exposés on, on uh, Big Pharma and how corrupt it is and how manipulated the system is. And if you want to check that information out, go join me on TikTok. We're, um, we're building that up because even if we get censored, we're still going to be on YouTube. We're not leaving YouTube or we're not leaving these other channels. But let's put, if you could, uh, Mel, put up our, our TikTok link in there. And, uh, you know, if you're not following me over there, make sure you follow me because we're going to have some unique and new content over there that I think is going to be awesome and you'll enjoy. And as always, remember what our mission is. It's to save 100 million lives. And to do that, you know, I can show up here and you guys can, can listen. But the only way I can really reach that level of, of people is if you help me share this information. So if you know somebody who's on blood pressure medicines or struggling with blood pressure, please make sure you share this information with them. It might just save their life and you might be, you know, one of our, our warriors on the road to helping save 100 million lives. So I need your help to do that. Thanks so much. Have a fantastic week and we'll see you next Monday evening. Hey, don't forget to tune in next week, same time, 6 p.m., Central Standard Time for another Pick Dr. Osborne's Brain Show. Bring all your toughest health questions to me. I look forward to answering them. And before you leave today, make sure you hit subscribe. And once you do, click that bell. That bell is gonna allow us to remind you right before we go live, but it's also gonna allow us to remind you when we come out with other video content all week long. We've got lots of episodes coming your way all week long and I don't want you to miss anything. So again, subscribe, hit that bell so that you can get notified when we have that new information put up for you. Thanks so much and I'm wishing you excellent health. Have a great week. We'll see you next Monday night.